Good evening, my name is Sari Nusebe, and um, as I was described, I'm from East Jerusalem, uh, Palestinian, but I was born in Damascus uh, during the time when my parents, my family, were one of those on my mother's side, uh, made to uh, leave the country because of the war. They ended up in, in Syria, so I was born there in Damascus. And, uh, but I practiced my right of return when I was about one or two years old. Just after the war, I came back to Jerusalem with my parents and have lived there, apart from uh, going abroad every now and again. Now, um, I was only going to say one or two things, actually two things, but now I'll add a third thing, having listened to the previous speaker. Uh, I'm not going to address everything that he said, but I do wish to say that I was uh, personally involved in much of the talks uh, that led up to Oslo um, as part of the Palestinian team, negotiating team, and I can tell you, assure you, that all of us on the Palestinian side were committed to a two-state solution with everything that implied, with the recognition of Israel's right to exist, with the that came the demand for the recognition of Israel as a Jewish state, I may remind you, came later in time. At the beginning, all we were asked to do was to recognize the right of Israel to exist, and we did. There was no problem. Anyway, and no, no, much, no. I'm not discussing. No, just, uh, no, I did not come into your strategic sorry, discussion, sorry, sorry. so I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'll forgive you, I think. I've forgiven a lot. <laughs> Okay, um, so as far as we were concerned, uh, as I said, we were committed, and although I don't personally like Abu Mazen, I think Abu Mazen, in fact, is one of the most committed people I know to a two-state solution, a real two-state solution with Israel. Now, uh, but I'll come back to talking, and, and if such a solution were to be offered, I'm sure you'll find the Palestinian partner, if there's an Israeli partner to offer it you will find a Palestinian partner. But anyway, I want to say two things, also connected in a way or another with what I heard being said before by, uh, by, by you and by, the, by Maron. Which is, uh, one thing is this, it is that in a way I agree with what's been said concerning the ambiguity of a two-state solution. And, uh, but, but my sense of the ambiguity, ambiguity of, this, of this is a little bit different. Um, and I want to start by saying that when we began, people like myself, my colleagues, uh, people in the Palestinian leadership, thinking about the two-state solution, we had in mind a particular uh, contour for such a solution, a particular framework in our minds. But as time proceeded, day after day, month after month, year after year, and it's been 20 whatever years, uh, the contours of such a solution has indeed changed in our minds. So the solution that we had in mind when we started does not quite look the same as the solution that is or may be possible today, if a solution today is possible. Now, this has uh, led me to thinking something else, which is perhaps there is no such thing, now I go back to something that was said right at the beginning, uh, perhaps there's no such thing as a solution uh, to begin with. In other words, we all speak as if there exists a solution, for instance, a two-state solution, that it's more or less clear what that is, and the only question is whether we will arrive that there or not. Uh, just like, for instance, we assume there are specific solutions, say, to problems in arithmetic, that, or, or you know, simple problems, that you, know, you add five and six, and there is an answer, and the answer is 11, and, and you know it. I think it is, anyway. Uh, so one assumes in the, same kind of, uh, in the same kind of way that there is a solution uh, at this level, the political level, and it's just a question of getting there. But as I say, maybe there isn't. Now, if there isn't, in, in any real sense, a solution, 
Uh, this does not mean that we are either close to it or not close to it. In other words, uh, since it's not there, how can we measure how close or not close we are to it? Now, this means the following, I think, that we shouldn't be surprised if uh, overnight, suddenly, uh, a solution that we assume is in existence somewhere as a two-state solution suddenly comes to be realized. Somehow, without our knowledge, without our full awareness of the uh, facts surrounding the case or the circumstances, something happens, uh, just like a lot of things happen in the world, like the breakdown of the wall in Berlin, uh, like a lot of things suddenly happen. And it's not inconceivable, therefore, that something can happen, in spite of the fact of it's looking extremely unlikely, given the objective circumstances and conditions and facts that we all know very well. So we shouldn't be surprised. Now, but what does this mean? It means that if something like that were to happen, at some point, whether now or any time in the future, and I don't want to disappoint you or, or to make you feel uh, upset about this any time in the short distance future or long distance future, it needn't be the two-state solution that you or I now or may now have in mind. But what it means is that somehow or another, one way or another, um, and you know, this is basically uh, a sense of, uh, of optimism that I have, we will find a solution. And maybe we will call it a two-state solution. And maybe, hopefully, we'll all live happily with it. So that's one thing I wanted to say, that one has to keep the hope in a solution. It may be a two-state solution, whatever the contours of such a solution. And it may happen today or tomorrow, or it may happen you know, 10 years from now or 50 years from now, God knows. Um, but it's nice in the meantime to continue hoping. Now, that's the first thing I wanted to say. Now, the second thing I wanted to say that's changed, the one thing was to do with the conception of two states on our side, on the side of the Palestinians. The second thing I wanted to say was this, that what we started out as 23 years ago on the Palestinian side, namely a partner, a party that could negotiate a solution today, we no longer have today. Um, we have, in many ways, as Palestinians, really failed ourselves, failed ourselves. We failed on many fronts. Uh, we failed in uh, giving the people that we promised uh, the solution that we promised them, uh, and we did promise them a two-state solution. We failed to give them this, whether it's our fault or, or their fault or a combined fault, but we failed. And we failed also on the more, I think, important front of providing the people with the kind of uh, values, that life, that we assumed we would provide them with once the occupation was lifted. Because I want to tell you that um, previous to the negotiations and under occupation, when we uh, people in the occupied territories resisted that occupation, it wasn't because we were resisting the Jewish people or the non-Jewish people or whoever people. It was because we were under occupation by something, call it what you will. We didn't care. What mattered to us was that we are under occupation. And under occupation, we felt denied as human beings of having or feeling that we are equal with anyone else and everybody else. So we were hoping, by lifting the occupation, by fighting against the occupation, that we would be able to offer those values we felt we were missing under occupation, like life with dignity, like freedom. And unfortunately, on this front too, we the Palestinians have failed ourselves in the last 20 or 30 years. So our experiment, so to speak, in addition to its uh, having failed at the peace front, has also failed on the uh, front of building up 
the kind of credible institution that a credible Palestinian would be proud of. We are not proud, I can tell you, of what we have built, neither in terms of the government we have, the authority we have, nor in terms of the achievements we've made on the peace front. And I say this, although I, you know, I associate myself, although I'm not part, never been part of the Palestinian Authority, but I say this in full solidarity with that authority, because I feel I'm part of that authority in some way or another. And, you know, I failed. And I think Israeli leaders today must stand up and say also that they failed. And this is the second thing that I wanted to say. Solution, failure. And thank you. You said three things. Thank <laughs> you.